At this time, we want to honor uh, our graduating seniors from high school, and we have one this morning that we're going to recognize. Uh, the pastor at this time will be please come and stand down front as we recognize uh, our uh, graduating senior. We have uh, Garrett Wilkinson, uh, graduated from Houston High School. We have a few pictures that we're going to show you. <laughs> Yes, I was just there. After, uh, after graduating high school, uh, Gary plans to attend the ICC. So please give Gary a hand in this. Also, at this time, we have some, uh, some graduates as well from college that we want to recognize. So when I call your name, please stand, and uh, we will recognize you. Uh, Crystal Watson. Crystal Watson. Crystal Watson uh, graduated from Everest University with a criminal justice degree. Uh, Brennan Key. Brennan. All right, Brennan. Uh, graduates uh, with an associate's degree from Northwest Community College. He was a scholar athlete on the baseball team. He will be continuing on the Ole Miss. Uh, Callie Moore. And she, she is a crew. That's right. She's out there. Daddy, we can stand up. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, Callie graduated from NBW with a BS in uh, nurse, Nursing Science. She served as junior and senior representative for our Student Nurses Association. She was also the chairperson for the prayer ministry at BSU at NBW. So, uh, Yance Paul. Yance. And he's all the way in the back. Here we go. Up top. Uh, graduates with BS from uh, Mississippi State Communications with a concentration on public relations. Uh, he completed the, he will complete his internship upon graduation this past weekend. So he just completed his internship when he graduated Saturday. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So one day. One day. All right. James Kellen Blizzard. Is he not here today? Well, we're recognizing he uh, graduates with a BS in uh, aerospace engineering from Mississippi State University. Nikki Baker. All right, Nikki, uh, she graduates with Associate of Arts at Northeast Community College. She'll be transferring to Mississippi State seeking an ele elementary education degree. All right, Zachary uh, Wilkinson. All right, Associate degree from ICC, uh, continuing on to Mississippi State, seeking a degree in accounting. Please give our uh, graduates. I believe the significance of that passage is 
that what he sought more than anything else was to do the will of God, to know the knowledge of God, and to live by that instruction. And when he committed to do that, God responded by giving him the very things that people so often seek. Don't seek after the things of the world. Don't seek after riches. Don't seek after fame. Don't seek after those things. Seek the will of God to have it clearly in your mind so that you know with a discerning mind what it is for God to do in your life. And when you do that, God will bless you. We will not know how He'll bless you, but I promise you, He'll bless you in a mighty way. And I share that, for one, because it's the truth not only that graduates need to hear, but I believe it's the truth that all of us need to be reminded of uh, often. But the other thing, the other reason I read that is, is because this morning, I'm on a schedule of what I read. And you've heard me talk about that since 2008. The divine, the divine mentor and, and those selections of scripture that, that, that we read each and every day. And when we miss a day, we're trying to make it up. We just move on and read whatever that passage is for today. Well, one of the passages that I was to read today was 1 Kings chapter 3. Before I read it, I asked the Lord to give me whatever I needed to hear today for my life. I didn't ask him to give me something to say to graduates. I asked him what I was to, I was to have for my own life. And as I read 1 Kings chapter 3, the same Holy Spirit that led me to read it also is the same Holy Spirit that told me what I was to say right now at this time and to live out throughout my life. I truly believe graduates. I truly believe church members and visitors. I believe for all of us that if we'll seek the will of God, in his word daily, he'll guide us. He'll give us whatever we need. He'll give us what we ask. He'll give us beyond what we ask. Follow the word of God. He'll provide what you need.
Bible, let's turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. This morning we're going to begin a sermon series on Sunday morning. It's called Reaching Out, God's Plan to Reach the World. I shared with you a few weeks ago that I believe the two greatest things of application for our lives that Christ said was one, when they asked him what is the greatest commandment, he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, it begins in our personal relationship with Christ, like I spoke of just a few moments ago. That continues when we let that roll over and overflow into the lives of others around us. And then, of course, the second greatest thing he said, and I don't mean that in order necessarily, is the Great Commission. And in the Great Commission, he instructed us that as we go, we tell others of the hope in Christ Jesus. Now, the reality is some of us may feel uncomfortable sharing our faith. The reality is that some of us may not feel empowered to do that, may feel awkward doing that, may not do it a whole lot, quite honestly. But I believe that the plan A of God is that Christians who have been changed by their surrender to the Lord Jesus ought to let that only flow into the lives of others and answer the spiritual questions that others have about how you can find an answer. If everybody was hungry and you found food, food enough to feed everyone, would you not go tell others where they could find the food? If you were lost in the desert, had no hope, and found a man, and you were with others, would you leave the rest of them? I guess it depends on who it is. <laughs> would you leave the rest of them there and go find your way? The reality is our job, our responsibility, our opportunity is to join God in sharing with others what God shares with us. Now, when Christians refer to other people, people who are not Christians, professed Christians, people who need the Lord, people who have never surrendered their life to the Lord, people who are outside of a relationship with Christ, the term that has so often been used is the term lost. They are lost without the Lord. Now, if you don't like that term, understand we didn't come up with that term. Jesus used it. He's the one that said himself that he came in Luke 19, 10, he said, I've come to seek and save that which was lost. We get that term as well from that passage that reminds us of the parables. The stories that told illustrated truths of the Lord. One was the parable of the lost sheep. And he left the 99 to find the one lost sheep. Speaking of God's effort to bring everyone into the fold. We speak of that when we talk about the lost coin. Being that the lady lost the coin and swept and tore up her house trying to find that coin. If you've ever, this morning as I got ready to leave, I couldn't find my car keys. One of the blessed angels in my home must have moved my car keys. <laughs> God bless them. I would have searched the house. Left everything in the cupboard, looked the same place four times. Do you do that too? Ain't it crazy? I don't look in this drawer. Ain't it crazy? You know? That's where we get that term from. When he talks about the lost son, again, that's where we get that term from. It's, it speaks of one who is still looking, who hadn't found the answer and is still looking. Now there was a day not long ago when someone, everyone seemed to know what it meant when you said that someone's lost. If you were to walk down the streets of Houston, standing on the square and tell someone, you know, the greatest thing that guy is he's lost. There was a day when everyone probably in Houston that you talked to knew whether they agreed with you or not, they would know what you were talking about. But the reality is that term is gone in days past. I want to be clear about something. America is not good with the litter. They no longer know the word God. And it is not Christian friendly. It is not keen on what could be considered derogatory terms. If you don't understand that, then remember two years ago when Tim Tebow privately, but in a public forum, knelt his knee before the Lord after scoring a touchdown and thanked God 
for what he empowered him to do. Immediately, he became a mock and somewhat a scandal as they talked about Tebow. And everybody loved to have some kind of shot of what they did in their Tebow. They made fun of it. There was never any fines lifted, given at all about that. No one was ever suspended for saying anything about that. Uh, it became somewhat of a mock. However, just in the past days, the same NFL that Tim, Tim, Tim Tebow played place for has um, celebrated the fact that one man was drafted after he spoke openly about what he does in the bedroom. Now, quite honestly, I don't care what he does in the bedroom, okay? We didn't even know that. And the reality is we live in a world that so often now is twisted in what they see as a priority as what they see as what is something to congratulate or something to, uh, uh, to, to stand behind. And the reality is, um, folks, uh, we live in a different day. And so what do we do? Do we bow up? Do we get mad at a world that is desperately lost and respond to them negatively in that sense? By no means. We'll never win the world for Jesus by sticking our fist in there. We'll never do it. What do we do? We check the winds of time. We understand the climate in which we live. We become sensitive to that climate. And we work as best we can for the Lord Jesus to win as many people as possible. Now, how do we do that? We become more sensitive to what offends other people when we're trying to win Jesus. And today, if you tell somebody you're lost, Many times, they would be so offended by the term that they wouldn't want to do it. They wouldn't bother to listen to it. And the reality is, you may say, who cares if they get offended by my term? I get offended by what they do. We ought to care. Why? Because God's plan A is for us to win the world to Jesus Christ. And by the way, there is no plan B. He has enabled us by the Holy Spirit to do it. We have a responsibility to do it and to do whatever we can to make that difference. Paul said that we ought to go out of our way not to offend others. Christ said we are to reach folks. It's hard to reach them when you turn them off. And so besides that, I believe sometimes when we use the term, we think of people without Christ derogatory, meaning that, well, he's just one. What does that mean? Does that mean we've written off? Does that mean he has no hope? Now, yes, the term is biblical. But sometimes the attitude that comes with the term is not biblical at all. I was introduced to a term a few years ago that I bristled at to start with, quite honestly. It's got its problems still, I believe. I, I didn't like it. And the term referred to non-Christians as pre-Christians. Pre-Christians. Now, my thought immediately was, we don't know if they're going to ever become Christians or not. How can we call them true Christians? They may never be Christians. They may never surrender their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is true. They may not. But the more I thought about that term, the more I considered it, I thought if we would see everyone without Christ as a potential Christian or just as a pre-Christian, we may be more open to share we may be seeing the desperation that is that we share. And Christ has told us to share. And so today I want to talk briefly about pre Christians, potential Christians. People that we have a responsibility to share with. I want to be clear about something. We are not responsible for the result of our sharing, whether they come to the Lord Jesus or not. I will not confront Christ in glory about the fact that somebody did not receive the invitation that we gave to the power of the Holy Spirit on behalf of Christ for them to come to the Lord. However, we are disobedient when we don't offer the opportunity of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and promised by the Lord. And so it's our job to share the message. I can throw out seed. I'm hoping this time when I weeded and weeded my yard that it killed those little white flowers. 
Okay? It didn't do it the first time. It held them back a little bit, but it didn't do it, so I did it again. And I'm hoping this time it'll work. Listen, our job, as Jesus described it, is to throw seed. Whether it comes up or not, whether it works, it's not our responsibility. We're not responsible for the soil. We're responsible for the seed. And so we have a responsibility to throw that out, to do that. Now listen, some of you have already said, ah, oh, listen, that's not me. Well, don't excuse yourself from it. Don't ask it. Will you just, for just a moment, ask the Lord Jesus, Lord, if I need to look at this in a different way, if I need to have a greater passion for this, if I need to go about this in a different approach, or what, if I even need to approach this, and I've never done that before, or I don't do it anymore, will you show me and empower me to do that today? Please don't cut yourself off from something because you may be quiet or because you don't want to feel uncomfortable or because you just don't feel good at it. Instead, understand the responsibility that God has given us. I want you to see that the word of God says about those, what I'll call pre-Christians or potential Christians, those that need to respond to the truth of God. Notice what it says in Romans chapter 1. Beginning in verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they didn't honor him God, or give thanks to him, but they became pure in their thinking and their foolish hearts were dark. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the create the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and amen. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with, with women and were consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over. Oh, oh, Gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness and evil, covetous, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are maliciousness. They are gossipers, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boasters, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to them. Do you think, understand that a long, long time ago, God planned in Paul's heart and mind a message to Rome of God's seed. Do you think that the power of the Holy Spirit, the relevance of the message of Paul to Rome, is applicable today? How it is. And I believe we have a responsibility to respond to it and respond to it correctly. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll help us this morning, in just these next few moments, to open our eyes. To open our eyes at the opportunity that lies before us. Pray, oh God, that you'll help us to understand the importance of our role in the matter. God will be diligent to do it. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to begin this morning just giving you five quick truths about pre-Christians. Pre How do you describe the law? How do you describe the pre-Christians? I want to give you five truths that you need to understand that I believe are consistent with Scripture and may somewhat enlighten you and, and make us more aware 
of the situation that we're in such time as this. I don't think we can disenfranchise ourselves from this. I don't think we can forget our responsibilities. But in order to do what we need to do on behalf of the Lord, we need to understand this. The first thing we need to understand is pre-Christians in our world today are ignorant of the Bible. They're ignorant of the Bible. Now, we assume folks are not. We assume that. They may not think they are. I often hear scripture misquoted. It's usually prefaced by something like, well, you know, the good book says somewhere. And then he'll tell me something that his grandfather said, you know. Or something that he believes. Or something that he heard on he off. <coughs> or something that's just all being there. I mean, we just have a way of, of doing that. And, and some will say, you know, you know what the good book says, the truth sets you free. So you ought to tell the truth. Well, that's not what it says. It says the truth sets you free, but the truth is personal. And in that, it speaks of Christ. And Christ is the one that's set you free. All right. The one that's often used is God's not going to put more on you than you have. Now, the reality is, I think that is a very loose translation of Romans 8, 28 that says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. But I promise you that God will allow things to fall upon you that's more than you can have. He will put on you more than you can have. And so what you do is you give it over to him. When you cannot have it, you give it over to him. You see, the problem with that is it's not just a, a minor thing. It's that when people misunderstand that, they think, well, I guess there's a way I can manage through this thing. It's, it wouldn't put me in this situation. I guess I just got to roll up and work it, work it out. No. No, you got to surrender. You got to surrender to the Lord, whatever it is. It's not in your strength, it's in His. And that, when you do that in the trials and in the valleys and in the difficulties of life, you grow in that. If all you do is bow up and say, well, I guess God gave you the bill of Alice, you just get mad because you don't think you have. It's about giving it over to Him. And so these misunderstandings of Scripture are crucial. They're important. Not only for the pre-Christian, but for the Christian. You need to understand what it says in God's Word. The Apostle Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. And I think he describes the day in which we live. He says, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, listen, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. I know that sometimes, and I try to be very sensitive to it, I know that sometimes what I say in this pulpit may offend somebody. I know sometimes the things that I refer to because of their own experiences and because of what they've seen in their own life, it, they may take offense to that. And if it's in my own words and I just misspeak, You'll tell me I'll apologize publicly. I'll do it. But I'll tell you what people often get offended at. They get offended by what the Word of God says. And I believe the Word of God is true. I don't believe our experiences are necessarily true. I don't believe our perspectives are necessarily true. I don't believe our feelings are necessarily true. I believe God's Word is true. So I'm just going to preach preaching the Word and let it fall where it may. And if I don't do that, and come after me, okay? But as long as we preach God's word, I promise you about time I like it. I promise you that it's going to rub up against life. I promise you there's going to be some things in your life that you're going to be resistant to hear that the Bible tells you not to be a part of that or tells you to change that even more than cut ourselves when someone we love is affected by that. It's going to rub up against us the wrong. We're going to want to hear a different perspective.
We're going to have itching ears to hear other options. But the reality is, the truth of God is just the same. So what the Apostle Paul says, and everybody did not like the Apostle Paul. If you don't know that, follow his life and watch what happens to him. But the Apostle Paul said, you know what you do? You deal with it. If people don't like what you say, you deal with it. You deal with it through Scripture. Faithfully preach truth and love and teach the Word of God. Endure hardship and do the work of an evangelist. That don't mean get a bus and go travel. Okay? But that means is share the good news of Christ right where you are. Now, I don't think that tons of innovation is needed for that. I believe you will need the Word of God. And I believe through the power of the Holy Spirit of God working in and through His living Word that He breathes through, I believe it gives us instruction that we need in life. I believe it provides the conviction through the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe we can provide the conviction for somebody else. I believe it takes care of it. So we just keep driving back to the Word. Nothing can matter. You don't have to understand it all. You just need it. To rest in. Tell folks the simple old story of Jesus. Tell them of the love for Jesus. Tell them how he changed your life if he has. Tell them how you're different from that. Give them hope in this service. Because this people that don't know Jesus are ignorant of what the Word of God is. Too many Christians are ignorant of what the Word of God is. That's why I'll never apologize for continuing to say. You need time daily with the Word of God. You need time daily with the Word of God. You need to ask God to, to open your minds to understand what He had to say to you. A personal, customized Word for you today. You need the Word of God. People out there that need the Lord, they're ignorant of what the Bible is. The second thing is they're seeking life before death. They're seeking life before death. Now, let me explain myself to that. Verse 23 says, They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creepy things. Now, listen, you may replace God with creepy things, but I don't know that you're really creepy things. It's a different culture in which we live today. They had all kinds of icons and idols that they made out of wood and worshipped in that kind of thing. We don't have to that now. We go buy our idols and put them in the yard. Go enjoy ourselves in them and all that kind of stuff, you know. Sometimes our schedule is on our idol. We've got agendas that we have to do and carry out. That's what's most important. Most whatever. Those things change with culture and time and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is they had things that came in the way of them being given that they could be forgotten. And before all of those things in their lives begin to speak so loudly that they just they just ignore what God had to say. We live in a day. I want you to be clear about this. We live in a day when many people are not interested in eternity's benefits. They're just not interested. They don't like thinking about dying. Maybe if we just forget about it, go away. You know? It's like some folks get sick, they don't want to go to the doctor. They don't want to know what's wrong. They just don't want anybody to tell them. I'll be all right. I'm just going to tell them. You know? It, it don't matter. It's just, just I just don't want to know. And many are just the same way with their life. They're worried about life. They're not really worried about death. I mean, there was a time when you would speak of hell and people would respond and they would come whether they really made a surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ or whether it was just some fire insurance and they were hoping to get. I believe that God sells those policies. I believe instead it's a relationship that saves you. But regardless, when you spoke of that, all oh, people trembled. When Jonathan Edwards talked about sinners in the hands of an angry God, they said that people gripped the pew so hard in front of them that they left handprints in them. That they literally could almost, they could sense that the floor was giving way as if they were, they were just hanging above him. Horrified by it. Now, the reality is people are not that afraid anymore. God told us years ago that only a third believe hell exists. Excuse me. A third don't believe it exists. Only two thirds believe it exists. Only half of those not in church even believe in hell. And only 
six percent will leave their government. So even if there is money, don't buy me. Do you want to know what gets their attention more than that does? Why? Why gets their attention? It's in the here and the now. And thank God the eternal life that Christ gave gives. And John 10, 10 says a thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He's not only talking about an eternity with heaven. He's talking about eternal life, which is not only a quality of life forever in the presence of the Lord, but a quality of life from the day in which we surrender our life to the Lord Jesus. He's changed me. In this life, and because of what he's done in this life, I look forward to going to eternity. I just want to celebrate what he's done in my own life. The difference that comes through his peace. The difference that comes through his grace. The difference that comes through his love. And, and listen, if you put feet upon that, listen to me. If you put feet upon that and you live that out before them, it is one thing to say that you believe in the Lord. It's one thing to say that you rest in Him. But when they watch you go through those circumstances, putting your trust in Him and see the difference that you make, I know of two that completely inspire me every time I visit with them. Because the circumstances in which they face are overwhelming, yet they've got a peace in the midst of the circumstances. I know their relationship is real with the Lord because I see how He's working and moving in their life, even when things are so busy. I see what God is doing in them. And because of that, it inspires me. Who, from everybody's, from everything I know, is much better off, but quite honestly, need that kind of strength and faith to know that I've got it if I ever get to the point where I have to lean on you, as heavy as that is in such difficult days. The difference is when we live it out before folks. When we seek opportunities to tell our story of the difference Christ has made in our True Christians are worried about this life. They're not really worried about death. They're worried about life. And so when we share with them that Christ is relevant to life today, it makes a difference for all eternity. It's effective. Third thing is, true Christians are conscious of doubt and little guilt. They're conscious of doubt more than guilt. Verse 28 says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, now, we come up with a, a lot of ways to justify our sins. Not, not, not legitimately justify it, but logically in our own minds. I mean, the reason why people that believe in hell don't believe they'll go is because they don't feel guilty. I, I mean, you, you got people on death row claiming to be innocent, and you got talk shows that are filled with people blaming their mother, father, husband, wife, boss, somebody. I mean, it definitely ain't me. It's got to be somebody else. And if we're not careful, we'll do that with everything that we face in this life. We'll say, it ain't me. This is my circumstances. It ain't me, it's her. It ain't me, it's them. It ain't me, it's him. It's somebody else. I didn't do it. He pointed to the snake. Adam pointed at Eve, and the reality was, he also pointed at God. He said, you put her here. We've been doing it ever since God. Blaming somebody else for our, our difficulty. We got a bad case for Kenny Hopkins. Nice day, I mean. And there's too much of that among Christians as well. I mean, let's be honest. When's the last time you met before the Lord because of recessive, redundant sin in your life that you've not surrendered to the Lord and walked away from? The reality is we're insensitive to it. And I'm asking Christians that. Well then, what do you think of a world that is ignorant of the Word of God and not really concerned about the cost of eternity? What they think about and what they've done wrong. Therefore, it don't help to tell them how bad they are. They already know they got problems. And you know what? They know you got problems too. We all got problems. Don't act like you don't. We do. And the reality is, the world knows that. They think. They think. When they try to hit us, as we get in the church on Sunday morning, they think, we think, we don't have problems. Look at them. They think they don't have a problem. And the reality is, we do, and so do they. 
particular direction and they doubt whether it's the right way. You know what? They doubt whether your way is the right way. They doubt the way that we live our lives is the right way. They doubt about their direction. They doubt about changing. So they just keep plodding along. And if we don't respond by showing them the difference that, that the Christian life makes and explaining that the difference is only found in Christ and that He loved us so much that He died for us knowing the state of our sins and that He died in order for us to be free and forgiven and sure that you can know, that you know, that you know where not only you spend eternity but who leads your life and you can have absolutely no doubts about it. The world needs to know Don't act like you know it. And don't act like you don't have any problems. You'll have no limitations in circumstances like that. Be honest. You need the Lord. Everybody needs the Lord. People need the Lord. Not only folks that are outside of relationship with Him. Thank God those who are in relationship with Him. Desperately need the Lord. But I'll tell you. The world without Christ is more conscious of their doubt about their direction than they are their guilt. The fourth thing is this. It's going to hurt. Pre-Christians have a negative image of the church. They have a negative image of the church. Some of the hardest institutions of faith To reach people for Christ is the church has been standing here as long as this has been standing here. You take a pair of church ministries, which are not really churches, but they're ministries that run alongside the church, do different things. Many times they're more effective. New church starts, no rules, no pedigree, nothing carried over from the previous generation. It's attractive. And they reach people because of that. Affiliations without memberships, those type of things, no commitment of them. It's attractive. And they're flourishing in reaching the free Christian. And I praise the Lord for it. The traditional church in many circles is struggling to reach the world. Why? I'll tell you what, from their perspective, why? They doubt the intelligence of you can be offended if you want to, but this is the reality. They doubt the intelligence of you. It looks more like club meetings than it does worship. And the language is exclusive. The attitude is exclusive. And the methodology appears to be key. It's not really about the message in so many churches. It's about how we do it. It's hard to reach folks, if that's the attitude. Not only that, but they doubt the relevance of the church. They doubt the relevance. I mean, are we simply beating our own drum, preaching to the choir? I have to turn around and preach to you now. Are we simply accommodating our own wants and our own wishes, applauding each other, or do we really care about what people are living with? Or do we really care what they need? They wonder about that. They doubt the relevance of the church. The third thing is, they doubt the credibility of the church. They doubt the credibility. Why? I heard Adrian Rogers say it years ago. He says, when you look in the, in the sky, the stars that you notice are those that are falling. They always get more attention. Those that always stay in their spot hardly ever are the ones that get the attention. And the reality is, Churches today are racked with scandal. It is put on the paper quicker than anything when some preacher messes up. People want to know what that is. And they easily look at the church and say, see, it ain't all it's wrapped up to me. And they easily want to, want to see uh, what it is. The unfaithful ministry gets the headlines. The hypocrite is what people point to. And in those overemphasized calamities, the church's voice is always weakened by that. I'm a firm believer that for the church to reach people today, 
You know, I'm proud of baby out on the bathroom. I mean, listen, mature Christians in the church are needed to reach the world. But we've got to be careful, folks. The message is sacred. The methodology is not. The message is sacred. The methodology is not. The truth does not change. The way we communicate that truth, the ministry and admission must always be evaluated. We ought to never be satisfied and to strive to reach people as best we can. Please, Lord. <laughs> George McLeod, many years ago, said it this way, and I'll close with it. I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace as well as the steeple of the church. I recover the claim that Jesus was not crucified on a table between two tables, but on a cross between two thieves, on a town garbage heap, at a crossroad of politics so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, and the kind of places where cynics talked smut and thieves cursed and soldiers gambled, because that is where he died, and that is what he died about. And that is what Christ's followers ought to be about. It's the day in which we live. It's the charge in which we've been given. And our response is, don't act dumb. Get our act together. Be relevant. And live what we share. And share what we live. And let God get the answer. And see what He can do through us. Let me get down and grab clothes. I want to ask you this morning. Do you know the Lord Jesus in a personal way? Do you surrender your life to follow him? How crucial it is that you know beyond a doubt that your child will be up. And that only comes when you surrender your life to follow him. If you've never done that. I want you to know that every time you sing a song at the end of the service, it's exactly for that. Now, if you're open to do it any time, we specifically align this time for that very purpose. And so if God's leading you this morning, and you know you need to surrender your life to Christ, you've never done that. That's what this invitation is. Maybe you're here and you have done that. We know you've done that. But the reality is your life is not one. That's going to be very easy to convince somebody to come to Christ. Because there's areas of your life, whether public or private, areas of your life that you need to surrender to Jesus. That you need to trust with him, allow him to empower and change. So maybe you're here and God's led you at this point, you know that. Maybe he's led you to be a part of this church, you know that. You want to find out information about that. I want you to know this every day is over for you, Tom. We love to share that kind of information with you. I don't know what God's telling you to do. I just know you're going to be satisfied if you do. So just surrender and follow him today. Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you. For the opportunity to give us a Christ. Help us to seize it and live in response to it. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand together as we send the invitation to be obedient to God.
Thank you, Lord, for letting us come into your house and worship you, Lord. Thank you for all your many blessings. I pray, Lord, that there's someone here today that sees you, Lord. I hope you can pray that you can touch him in a special way. Thank you for your mercy and thank you for your grace. Thank you for the gift. Thank you for the giver, Lord. Just give us the wisdom that we can use these ties in a way that benefits your kingdom. Jesus, thank you.